This week, we have Erica from Sailing Veracity on to discuss sailing the cold Pacific Northwest, the importance of safety in boating, and her goal of building a pen pal sailing club. I'm your host, Tyler, and let's get into the episode. I think a, a Christmas sailing parade. Did you did you take your boat out there? Um, so I actually didn't take my boat out that day, but I, uh, I, my marina, I'm like right at the end of the dock. So I invited all of my uh, coworkers to come check it out. So we all went out there. Um, it was supposed to be in the parade. Didn't end up happening. Felt like I didn't have enough lights. There wasn't like enough pizzazz because like, I still like to sail this time of year. So it's like, if I'm going to decorate my boat, like, like that caliber, I have to like not sail for like six weeks and I'm not willing to do that because this, <laughs> not time, worth it. this time of the year, no one's ever on the river, especially during the daytime, unless it's like Christmas ships, no one's out. So it's definitely worth like getting out there playing with the wind. Well, yeah, it's a whole different world. You're, you're up there. So, um, since I didn't really intro this yet, uh, everyone, this is Erica, um, at sailing underscore veracity, I believe on Instagram. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, and you're up in the Pacific Northwest, right? I am. So unlike most of the people we've talked to that are down in sunny, warmer areas, um, you're sailing up in cold winter time. Half I your am. Instagram, you're in what cold, foul weather kind of gear. <laughs> yeah, I have to have my foulies on this time of the year. I've got like several pair just because like I want to go sailing every day and sometimes they get wet on the inside and then you're gonna have a bad time. So got to have good foulies. Awesome. Well, let's uh, let's take a step back, and then I want to hear all about kind of the difference of sailing up there because I am sailing has captured my heart, and I want to start learning to do that. But I am definitely Caribbean based in my mind, so I want to hear about the differences. But what I like to talk to most people about, like to kind of get this off, is like you know some people grew up near the ocean, some people didn't, and we just want to talk to cool people who live, work, love, care about are on the ocean all the time. So. What is the first experience you remember having with the ocean and why has this captured your heart? You know, that's that's a really good question because I don't necessarily think it was even an ocean that like made me fall in love with like big bodies of water to begin with. And like even now, like I don't sail in the ocean regularly. I only crew on boats in the ocean. Like I grew up in northern Michigan. So like I grew up sailing Lake Superior with my dad and I think I was like uh ninth grader when I learned how to like sail like little dinghies by myself and then like before that I was like sailing like just like windsurfing learning how to sail with like just a little windsurf rig and uh really stole my heart um moved away from Michigan like as soon as I finished high school and like kind of like got away from it all um got really really into like skiing and snowboarding love the mountains it's kind of why I'm like split in between and that's why I'm up here right because there's snow and there's water uh, but you know, when I moved here, I kind of was like, I want to get back into the water. And I just kind of like dove right head first back into it. Um, and it's been great. It's been great. So it's nice being on big water, but like still confined into an area cause I'm alone, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, you are doing most of your sailing solo. Do you have like a group of friends that you sail with around there? <laughs> family you sail with? So many friends I like to go sailing with. I like to do buddy boating. I like to sail with groups of friends. I sail alone. Um, I sail alone mostly just to get practice. Um, that's what's really important to me. I want to get, I don't necessarily think I want to get a captain's license to do anything cool with. I just kind of want to like have enough hours to say I can do it. And yeah. I mean, unless you're looking to make money off it, you don't need that. I know. I'm not, and I'm not really looking to make money off of it, but it's just like something to say for it, you know? Yeah, I get you. In this lifestyle, because I like the lifestyle, I make I make great money doing what I do. I don't need to change what I'm doing anytime soon. <laughs> so I'm gonna stay doing what I do, but uh, sailing every chance I get in between. I mean, that's perfect. At the end of the day, you own a sailboat, and most people don't. So I call that a success. <laughs> you know, and it's crazy because like people will be like, "That's so wild! Like, how does that even make sense?" And it's like, honestly it's pretty easy to get a boat. Like if you're not like trying to like do huge cruising, like I'm actively now looking for a bigger boat to buy. So I can cruise in. Like that's where I'm at. I actually just made an offer like a month ago on a boat. They didn't take it, but like, that's where I'm at now. But like, if you're just someone that likes sailing, who's taken a couple courses, 
and you just want to get into sailing, it's pretty cheap to find a little boat. Like if you just need a little sailboat, it's at least up here, it's pretty easy to find. And slips up here are really like, I mean, they're all over. I know a lot of places don't have that um, luxury, but. If you can't trailer it down here, you're spending more than you are on rent to, to get a slip on your boat. Like I was looking at some slips around here just for fun. 3,500 a month. That's more than me and my roommate pay for this three bedroom together. Like it's ridiculous. That is pretty wild. That is pretty wild. I mean, I know and like I, when I'm more design, like Seattle, Seattle is like that. Mm -hmm. Um, but I have, I didn't have an issue finding a slip for my boat. Like I've moved my boat several times to just like explore and I haven't had an issue like whatsoever. And I think that's why there's a lot of the sailing communities more towards like Fort Lauderdale than actually down here in the Keys. Um, just because it's easier to get a slip space and then you take off for your couple week adventure, come back, take off, come back, take off, come back. But those who get the joy of day sailing around here, you know, we, we had a, a roommate at one point with a, a boat out here and we were just doing day sails and a lot of times it was put in, pull out, put in, pull out. So Some work. it's exhausting. Um, but to have that ability set up that you can just be like, you know what? I'm going to go that on a whim. I, I am so jealous. That's awesome. So tell us more about the boat you have and then what you're aiming for. Um, I currently have like a 1975 Catalina 27. She is definitely a project boat. I call her practice boat for so many reasons. Um, but, you know, she does the trick. Like, I can take her out confidently. She is going to manage really, really well in these currents that we have. Um, but when it comes to, like, thinking about taking her out in the bar, like, beyond, I'm not doing that with this boat. There's no way. You couldn't – there's not enough money on this table <laughs> for you to, like, convince me to take my boat out the bar. And, like, maybe if I hauled out and, like, put a ton of work into her, then, like, yeah, I would do that. But that's not where I'm at. I want to get a bigger boat. I want to cut her or catch rig. Um, recently looked at like a Fantasia 35 up in okay. the airport. Oh, I, I love that boat. I'm obsessed with those boats. If anybody knows what kind of boat I'm talking about right now, it's a center cockpit, like double ender. It's made by the same company that makes like Tayana's. And it is just such a beautiful boat. It feels like the inside is so livable. Like, it feels like you're in, like, a 45-foot boat. Like, I can't even explain. Like, the layout is so perfect. Um, I mean, I feel like there's more storage in that boat than there is in this, like, little tiny apartment that I live in. So, I really wanted that boat. The issue with it was uh, the mast up needed to be redone. I went up to go look at it, and it it was pretty bad. It was, like, I'd probably have to replace the whole deck of the boat, which is, like, at mm. least okay. So I was like still pretty like stuck on it. And I had all of my, but all of my boat friends were like, Erica, no, like don't, don't do it. Don't, don't make an offer on this boat. And I didn't listen to any of them. And I, I made an offer, but I made it like really low. Cause I knew I was going to have to invest in it. And then there was the whole, like, how do I get it down to me to even work on this boat? This is going to be a whole challenge. And uh, they ended up not accepting it, which is really, really good because after I made that offer, I started thinking about all of the logistics of it. And I was like, am I even ready to like move a boat down here and put all the work in? Because I still love sailing the river and I still have more to explore on the river, you know. So it might not be time yet to move to the bigger boat. I don't know. If just it's to, just flirting with like the I'm, idea. I'm flirting with it. I want, I want one. But like also I've been doing like all of these fun like crew opportunities too. So it's like. If I stay in Portland for another couple of years, might as well have my little boat to enjoy and then just crew on bigger boats. So what are these crew opportunities? What have you been doing? Oh, I've been going down to um, San Diego a lot. Down to San Diego and up to the Sound a lot, moving boats around the Sound. And then just San Diego is more of just like pleasure cruising. I have a friend down there that I like to go sailing with. So Nice. Good. Yeah. It's a whole whole different world. <laughs> yeah. And then I also, I have a, I have a pal in the bay that I went sailing with and that was probably some of the more fun sailing I've done. Um, it was spicy. It was pretty spicy. It was fun. It was during the, uh, Rolex big boat series too. So like the amount of just, oh, on you're the just water. surrounded. Yeah. You really had to like, I mean, silver racers are crazy. Like, I don't know if you know this, but they just like 
they'll get so close to you. They don't care. They don't care the rules of the road. They'll just. So my neighbor, if I can ever convince her to get on, she does not want to do this, but she used to race professionally in her like early twenties. Those people are cutthroat. <laughs> yeah, they are. They're I mean, the stories she has told about what they're doing to be willing to win. I think they get close to each other to mess with each other's boats, to be honest. <laughs> you see it in the <laughs> river. I've like, I've done crew opportunity for boats up here and I've like decided like, I'll never do my, I'll never volunteer to do it. Any kind of race on my boat because I've been in those positions where you're just like, it's like the slowest motion, like fast paced environment you can imagine. Cause like everybody before the start line is just like, constantly tacking around each other and as soon as you clear one boat you're like oh my god there's another boat right there and it's just constantly turning around each other and it's so stressful way too close to other people's really nice boats really nice race boats well yeah and they're doing this and all you're thinking is dollar signs like i can't afford to fix this mm -hmm. and they're thinking i can buy a new one tomorrow yeah yeah i guess perspective is everything right uh sometimes you wish you had it and sometimes it you know it makes you learn how to fix things like I, the biggest fear of owning a boat personally is that I don't have like the mechanical skills that I wish I had to be able to fix things. I have the people around me that can teach me. YouTube's a great thing. You know, there's, you can pay to have people come on and help out, but like, God, it, imagine you're out there at sea and you got to fix something on your own. Like I imagine you've learned a ton. So like, what are some of the biggest lessons you've learned from owning a vessel so far or crewing or just sailing in general? Um, I think the most important thing, honestly, is if you're going to take out friends that don't know, I mean, I don't know, not even with that, I would say if you're going to take out anybody on your boat that hasn't been on your boat before, having like proper instructions on what to do when something hits the fan, or when you need help, like having a crew that knows how to help you or how to get out of the way if they can't help you is very important. It's not even like, a mechanical skill that I possess. It's just the fact that every time I bring somebody on my boat before I go out, I sit them down and we have a conversation and it can be as short as you should. Yeah. Right. And it can be as short as like five minutes, but like, cause you don't want to like lose their attention. But if they seem like, Oh, like, Oh, this is actually more dangerous than I was expecting. Like tell me more then you can get more into it. But it's very important that everybody knows to respect water on your vessel. I mean, Look at commercial vessels. They're putting people on every day, and they're still giving a safety brief beforehand. And usually it's how to stay out of our way while we handle a situation. But even if that's what it is, they need to know how to help you. And that could be as easy as, hey, point at the person when they fall off the boat to get the hell out of my way whenever anything's wrong. Right. Yeah. I mean, it is it is really important. And I, I noticed because I have a lot of friends, you know, around here and – all actually just kind of in general all over like it doesn't happen all of the time and i think it's important to spread awareness about doing that because not everybody it's not their boat they don't have like that instinct to do what they need to do it's your boat they don't know it 100 percent. i mean and then the flip side of it that i've noticed is getting on some friends boats going out with them hey man uh you know cut myself where's your first aid kit Ah, there's some band-aids and stuff in the drawer. <laughs> you you got a you got like a we're going diving. You got some O2? Nah. <laughs> we're not a commercial operation. We don't need that. <laughs> yeah, I think we do. <laughs> Makes you a little uncomfortable, right? When you see all of this stuff. I have a friend that before I bought my boat here, I was going sailing with. And I realized really quick after the fact that like I grew up sailing. But I grew up sailing with my dad and my dad knows how to sail. And I knew a little bit about sailing and I went years without sailing. And when I got my boat, I basically like I knew how to do it. But like there was a lot of things that I was like, oh, I never thought about this or that or this. And it was very apparent to me that like my friends that I would go out sailing with, I was like, oh, they are they don't even take this stuff into consideration. And I think that's why I ultimately just like bought my boat. And because I wanted to have control of like those things. That makes uh, sense. Yeah. And that's why I kind of want my own boat someday. <laughs> Same yeah. thing. I'm a little type A sometimes, you know? 
So I feel yeah. you. And it's not even type A, but like if you've been in enough emergency situations where things weren't provided properly and you were told, hey, you're not in charge for a reason, you start saying, maybe I should be. Or can I at least check that we have the equipment on board? Mm -hmm. Um, So I feel you on that very much. Yeah, like as long as like somebody on board knows where it's at. Well, no, I think multiple people because like if that person, like if something ever happened and they were unconscious, like then you're SOL. Like, and that's not okay. You don't think about these people you're in those situations. Yeah, I mean, we brief everybody on the boat when we do our diving operations where all the equipment is because a lot of times the last time we had a medical emergency on the boat um one of the women was a nurse she was just a customer and her sitting down next to the person i think was able to help immensely because she was able to get a better um kind of grasp of what was going on because the woman was telling me what her her ailment was um because it was a pre-existing condition that flared up and i didn't know what it meant and then this woman's like i'm a nurse sat down and we were able to give EMS a much better idea of what was going on. And, you know, I teach CPR, first aid, all this kind of stuff for a living. But that doesn't mean I'm a nurse. And if you have a nurse, you have a doctor, maybe the captain gets hurt. You want those people to step in and have that ability. So, yeah, I think everybody should be briefed. Um, safety is something that is, I think, harped on by a lot of people, but not enough people. Or it's harped on like in a way where it's like sexy or cool, but people aren't actually learning. Does that make sense? I think, yeah, no, I'm, I totally understand what you're trying to say with that because like everyone will like brush. I think a lot of people will brush on it, but it's like they're not taking it very seriously. Like, oh, it's like sitting, it's like sitting in the airplane before the airplane takes off, right? Like you can relate. You've heard that how many times the last couple of weeks? I think I've been on eight flights this month, so. Can you rehearse or like, do you know, like even how to get the little, the little inflatable under the seat out? Like, have you ever even thought about that? We all know it's under there. But like, All right. So all I will, I'll agree that most people haven't, but I'm crazy. I, yeah. I, I <laughs> actually do know how to fall. And stuff You're like, actually. <laughs> have you ever heard the joke that 80% of American men believe that they could land a plane in emergency, even though they've had zero flight training? I am 100% those people. I know reality, it's not true, but I've got a plan in the back of my head. I will figure that out. You got to put on the headphone and radio in and they're going to tell you what to turn. I've looked at that door. Imagine opening it mid-flight, seeing what would happen. No, I'm I'm not that bad. (laughs) You're like, you got this, guys. Well, make sure I always book flights that you're on from now on because in case there's ever emergency, you're going to like pretend like land the plane for us. So it's going to be fine. Yeah, I'm bad luck. They'll all be delayed though. So uh, probably don't want to do that. That's the worst. All right. So back to sailing. Um, what big adventures do you have planned for maybe the next year? So you're doing everything kind of locally. You're taking some of these bigger, you know, crew opportunities along the West coast, especially if you want to get a bigger boat, like what do you want to do? Do you want to sail the world, do some big crossings, go live in the Caribbean for a year, go to South America? Like what is your sailing dream? My sailing dream, that's, it bounces back and forth. That's so funny that you ask. As long as I'm on a boat, I think I'm happy. Um, there's a lot of things I think about when it comes to like sailing. Oh, what did she just do? Um, I think that I think about sailing the world. I think about circumnavigating and like being able to see it all and how great that would be. But I also know that there's a lot of things just like in this side of the whole world, like what continent we are on now. Like there's so much stuff even to see inland. So like my my dream bounces back and forth between like having a boat big enough to sail the world, go to Tahiti, see all of that stuff, avoid the orcas in Spain. Um <laughs> Or the, the uh, med's kind of scary right now, isn't it? Yeah, no, like I just a big red X over that area. If I if I bought a boat, like I'm not gonna risk my boat, man. Like I won't even race my boat. You think I'm gonna put? Yeah, no, duh, no doubt. Um, but the other idea I have is I love the idea of getting like a trailerable trimaran and like just like because I would love like and then getting like a souped up like uh, I don't know, like a little van, like maybe like a G20 or something like an old school G20 and like deck it out and then like trailer the trimaran so I could sail the West coast or the East coast or like wherever my boat could be, because then I could like not like do what you do. Like I don't have to have a slip. 
I could be on anchor if I'm staying on my boat. And then when I'm done, I can just like put it back in its trailer and drive it somewhere safe, like hurricane season, keep it away, keep it in Michigan or somewhere, you know, I bounce back and forth between those. It's not a bad plan. I know, but trailer pull trimaran, I mean, like they're just less livable. They're like, it would, it, they're way less livable. Yeah. Like, and I'll be honest, my dream is a little bit bigger than something that's trailerable. Like right? it's, I'm going to need to be around for hurricane season. So I, can head really far south yeah and that's like that's the thing like i go back and forth because like have you seen some of the areas inland on the united states like it's actually really gorgeous like i spent a good chunk of time in the rockies and i've spent a lot of time like backpacking the appalachian trail and like checking out northern michigan like maine all of that it's so stunning and gorgeous and there's so much to it and so it's like i'm really torn with what i want to do it's like i like I like nature just as much as I like the ocean, you know? I, I think split time is the key, you know? Um, I want to be enjoying this weather, diving, sailing, all this stuff year-round. But it's not fun year-round. So those rest of those months, where's my cabin in the woods, you know? Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. But where's the money? <laughs> Where, yeah, it's always right. the... I always, um, I was, when I moved to Oregon, I was, I'm pretty infatuated with like floating homes. Like, I don't know. I don't know if they're down in Florida. They're pretty abundant up here. Lakes sound. in Texas had plenty of them. Never. <laughs> cool. I don't see many in Florida. <laughs> I could see myself like having like a home base and it's like, that's my home base. And when I'm not there, I could rent it out and like, then I could be sailing the world and then I could like literally come back and just dock my boat at my house. And like so many great ideas when it comes along with that. Like, I don't know. There's just so many opportunities in this world. It's hard to like navigate which opportunity you want to chase down. Right. But isn't that the fun part? Oh yeah. It's a blast. It's the scariest part, but it's the funnest part. So I mean, I'm with you big reset for the new year and it's not like a new year's resolution a resolutions thing. It's just like, this is when a few things have clicked for me and I have like eight paths I can pick. I don't know. And that's kind of the fun part, but sailing <laughs> definitely there's going to be some exploring kind of that world. So it's been really fun to get to talk to you about this and like kind of hear your experiences. Cause it is definitely different up in protected waterways up in the Pacific Northwest. I'm assuming yeah. than down here, a little bit more open ocean and Island hopping. Yeah. Well, and you know, like the crazy thing is, is like, I've like sailed up in the sound and like the South Sound, like being on the river stretch, like there's a lot of fun little islands and there's, I mean, going through the gorge, it's just, it's so beautiful. I mean, you're like in this canyon of waterfalls and green, lush, beautiful trees. It's just air so fresh and it's perfect, but you know, it can get dicey too, because you're in a gorge. And so the wind can pick up like that. And so it, it can be dicey. I need to get, I've been saving up to invest in a smaller head sail because it's like, I don't have a furling head. Like I'm old school, it's a practice boat. And so I don't want my, I don't want my 130 up there when the wind goes from 15 to 40, like in a Just snap. really takes the boat without any control. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be like without you even knowing. And then like the other thing that's probably a little different is like the dams. There's dams here, right? So this year, I'm my goal this summer is to sail all the way up to the Snake River into Idaho. Okay. Go through all the dams and come back to Astoria. That'd be pretty cool. That's what I want to do. I've been looking into it. There's a couple of things I want to invest in before I do it, but like I'm already like well into like that investment. Like I'm redoing my galley. I'm. Uh, putting a big, I have an outboard engine. My inboard doesn't work. I have an outboard engine. I'm putting a bigger like prop on it. And then I'm extending the shaft of the prop as well. So those things will help. And then I sealed my windows because I was sick of getting wet. <laughs> <laughs> I live in Oregon. So <laughs> a couple things are already on the way to get myself to that point to make that trip. Awesome. Well, then let's wrap today up with what we kind of first started talking about when we became like Instagram-ish friends, what, months ago? Yeah. We were posting about, and I don't remember the exact term, but like a pen pal sailing system yeah. that was like, 
kind of like you're you wanted to take the concept of what's like the young sailors but uh but actually spend time with each other and see these other places and see how other people sail so explain that more because i literally said let's wait and talk about it on the podcast and then like three <laughs> months have passed so <laughs> yeah no uh i think and i get mixed feedback depending on who i talk to it's the sailing pen pals is like I've met through, you know, social media, some of the coolest people in the world, guys and girls alike of just like passionate sailors who sail in places that I have never personally been to, whether it be, you know, in the States or not. And it makes you really curious. And it's like, well, weird, like, I'm never going to find a crew opportunity to like crew there because like who's moving their boat from there. And even if I do like, you don't know those people. So I have this great idea to turn like, instead of it being like crew finder where you like sign up for like taking the boat from point A to point B, it's more of just like a, Hey, let's like, let's meet, let's see if we can be friends. And like, let's swap, like, let's you come to my boat for a day and I'll come to your boat for a day. If like, that's something you're into. So it takes like the crew part out of it. And it's more of a community based thing. Well, And I kind of saw it as like an opportunity for, you know, some people want to sail the world. Some people have no desire. Like, but maybe I have a desire to explore a few places in the world. So, hey, I've got a boat down in the Caribbean. Example, I don't really. But I've got a boat down in the Caribbean. Come spend a week with me, and we're going to island hop. And then when we're done, next year, I'm going to come visit you in the Mediterranean and spend a week with you. And it costs either of us nothing but the cost, you know, to go sailing for the week. Fuel, food, stuff like that. But we're not spending the 20 grand to, you know, have our yachting adventure for the week or whatever. Yeah, you're not just... you're having food served to you and you're actually networking with people who like have very like interests and minds as you. Now, I think the biggest like problem would be like profiling everybody that wants to be a part of it, like making sure creepy people keeping stay it out safe. of it, keeping it safe and comfortable. But like that's like where I started thinking of other ideas where like, you could review the people who sign up their boats. So like an Uber, like how you like review an Uber driver, like you would review the boat and like the host and like the host could review the guest and all of these different things. And I think it would just be a really cool way to like build this community and for one and other sailors to like experience new places. I mean, it's, it's what a lot of people are already, already doing in DMs on Instagram, building relationships with people over a year or two before they're going and visiting and sailing and getting more of an idea of who they are, but just doing a little bit more structured. I'm not sure how, how to actually pull that off because, like, man, I've been on Crew Finder, and some of the things people post are creepy as hell. Yeah. Like, 54-year-old man only looking for single female sailors willing to take three at a time. Like, dude, did you even know how this looks? You look like an axe murderer. Like, yeah. So, I mean, even like on Instagram, I've had my fair share of uncomfortable messages from primarily men that say just like, like, what? Why would you even say that right now? Like, who says that? And unfortunately, that's when they get removed from my page. And it's just like, I wish I could take that whole stigma out of it, you know? Well, unfortunately, I think that's a stigma of the world that we got to work on, and it really sucks that there's a lot of dudes that will do that, but we got to find a way to get the creeps out and create a really cool sailing adventure for people. Because, well, I mean, <laughs> who who doesn't all want to live that YouTube sailing adventure for a minute? I just oh. want to do it without having to do it year-round, you know? Pop in, pop out, pop in, pop out. <laughs> right? I get that. Well, I think that you're well on your way to figuring that out yourself. I think I'm on my way to navigating my route to it as well. Amen. Well, we'll keep sharing ideas and figuring out cool stuff. And if you've got cool people that you have met over the time, let me know. I always want more people to interview, and I'm hoping to actually be more consistent in this in the new year. And thank you to everyone who listened to me kind of sniffle through this episode. I have allergies that have been kicking my butt from visiting Texas home. And I just got back to the keys and it's all coming out. So I apologize for any of the little sniffles throughout the episode. <laughs> um, but thank you so much for doing this. Um, if you want to plug your Instagram or anything like that, please go ahead. If you don't, feel free not to. Whatever. <laughs> yeah, you guys can check out my Instagram. It's uh, sailing underscore veracity. So you can just find me through there and uh, watch my adventures on the um, Columbia River. 
Awesome. Thank you so much, Erica. And we'll see everybody in the next one. All right. Thanks so much. Thanks for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a five-star review and rating wherever you listen. And connect with the show on Instagram or TikTok at Anchor Lines Podcast. We'll see you on the next one.